Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Henkel, excellence is our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 285 for May 1st, 2015. FCA's Santa Claus shares some of his Easter eggs. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific or 19 hours GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Well, Gary, we find ourselves here yet again. We do, John, and uh, I thought it was interesting to see that on Auto Line Daily today you had the HRV, and uh, remember we were on that program several months ago, and we couldn't, you couldn't talk about it until today. Nah, right. And earlier this week I was on the, Hilo, the Honda Pilot program, and I can't speak about that for several weeks. So, Yeah. Funny how these things happen. I think they had problems at the plant. I've never had an automaker ask us to sit on information for two months. So it's uh, so we we can get into small that world. Later, st- later in the show. We got to let everybody know we got Drew Winter from Ward's Auto World with us. Drew, great, great to have be you here. here. And we got to let them know our special guest too is Klaus Busse, head of all interior design at FCA yeah. USA, formerly known as the Chrysler Group. <laughs> but Klaus, great having you back. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Always fun being here. Yeah, and, you know, uh, Wards does this great interiors design show, too, so we especially yep. wanted Drew here on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here wow. with that. How do, yeah. we grill? How, how do we get all the great information out of Klaus? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Klaus, how long have you been doing this? I mean, we've, we've known each other for years now, it seems. Yeah. And uh, uh, This is actually, um, I know you have your 300th show coming up, my 10th year. So on uh, July 1st, it'll be exactly 10 years at uh, Chrysler, Daimler Chrysler, now FCA. Wow. It's been a long, good, good, rewarding journey, but it yeah. felt like it was just a couple of years. Crazy how time flies. Mm-hmm. Hey, I just noticed right now you got a Hellcat T-shirt. Well, yeah, it's my favorite T-shirt here. <laughs> that right? is the cool. But but you can't buy those, right? It was no. only the Hellcat team no, no, that this got is, those. Yeah, the launch team uh, shirt. Yeah, it's a cool shirt. It's actually one of these really nice. You know, sometimes you get these shirts and they go into the cupboard. This is a cool shirt. And I I, I just love the graphic of mm. the Hellcat on it. I would buy that shirt. I'm not big into T-shirts. Uh, no, no. We're going to do an after show jerky yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your shirt on, Klaus. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so everybody talks about the Hellcat in terms of the engine. Did yeah. you guys do something special on the interior? Well, the interior is, uh, is not uh, different to the, uh, to the SRT standard interior. Um, you get a Hellcat logo, uh, but that's about it. No, the interior is, is, is standard throughout. The Hellcat is really classified by, by the performance, by the engine, and then some body parts that provide that extra cooling. Except there is something special on the <clears throat> interior, and that's on uh, the infotainment mm-hmm. screen. You can call up all different kinds of performance parameters. That is correct, and that. but that is, that is already available for the SRT package. So once okay. you go into the SRT in fact, world... In fact, we got it up. On the there you go, there. and this is actually pretty cool because you, you, we, we now you see us really putting UConnect to use. Mm-hmm. We just yesterday um, picked up another award from from a different outlet uh, calling UConnect Infotainment System of the Year because it's ease of use, and we're now building on that, and we're, we're creating these special pages for SRT. So d- the graphics are awesome. They're mm-hmm. clean. They're big. They're easy to read. There's a lot of depth to them. Is that part of interior design? Absolutely. So everything you see here, all the graphics are done in my camp in the user experience group. We work with Uconnect Group. Uconnect mostly provides the, you know, the services, the, the technicalities behind it, the silver box, etc. But the graphics, and then we work with HMI for the flow. But the graphics, everything you saw on those screens are all done in the interior organization. Kudos to you guys, because in my book, those are mm. the best in the business. Certainly amongst the best in the business. Well, yeah, Uconnect, works, yeah. Uconnect works fantastic. Yeah. But, but you know, when, when, when uh, I did an interview recently on the... Um, interiors conference and 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 our 10 best interiors for this this year and and i thought back and and i said i think christ has gone from worst to best really in about six years and i just wanted to see 
if I mean you've talked a lot about your your tough times and and your transformation is that about the time frame you see it or, or certainly when, when probably considering design it goes back farther than that but I mean no I, th I think the six years is is is, a, is is the right time frame for what you see as a customer um, which would take us back to 2009 when we launched the uh, Durango the Dodge Ram and, yeah. uh, Durango came in 2010 but okay. but in 2009 late 2008 that's when the Dodge Ram came out that was the first interior that really stood for what we try to do. But obviously, as you know, it takes two plus years to develop. So the work started in, you know, 2005, 2006 with the launch of the Ram in 2008. And then since then, the products that you've seen. Speaking of Ram, and I know we got some pictures here. You guys have this Texas Ranger yeah, right. edition. This stuff is crazy, Ben. Let's bring up any, any of the pictures there from the interior of this car because it's so that was a special edition we did uh, to support um, the... <laughs> like this. <laughs> there you go, the Texas Rangers. Um, now, this is a one-off vehicle that we've donated to the Texas Rangers to support uh, what they do down there and help them raise uh, money because it's, uh, they're not really well-funded, something that, that will probably be a surprise to a lot wait, of people. Hold that one, Ben. Stay yeah. on that one a minute. What's this like, you know, it looks like the sheriff's badge it, on the center that's of the exactly council? That's exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's the Texas Rangers badge. This is like a, a solid aluminum piece that we milled out and put on, on, on there. But it looks somewhat tarnished or it looks like yeah, it's yeah, been out it, on the range. Weathered. Yeah, no, yeah. The, the, the Cullen Trim team did a fantastic job to actually weather the material, yeah. so it actually looks like it's been there around. But uh, I don't know if you have an image also of the door we have a, a real there you go yeah. now this is this is special this is a, a Mexican coin and there's a lot of history with these coins are these real coins this is a real coin that we <laughs> bought off so eBay awesome. we bought those off <laughs> eBay four of them I'm not going to tell you how much they were okay oh so this is a, 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 a one-off this is a one-off vehicle oh, okay. Oh, okay. genuine coins in there but the, the relevance of that coin is when the Rangers came uh, came together as a group and we're talking about uh, you know 1960s when when they came to this point where where they felt like we got to find a way to identify ourselves out there because there was no real dress code for them there was no real uniform they could wear what they want as long as their gun so they, they um, one of the ladies, one of the wives of a Texas Ranger, she had like 40 of those coins at their home for whatever reason. And they said, there's, there's the material that we need. So they took the coins and they used it as the material and they just stamped the badges out of it. So if you look at a Texas Rangers badge from that time, you'll see the leftovers of the structure of the coins in there. That's, that's the relevant of the wow. coin. And we, we found those coins, real coins, the genuine coins, and we put them because of that into the vehicle. Cinco pesos. Absolutely, absolutely, that's what it is. And I know it's of course Cinco de Mayo, but, but uh, yeah. no. <laughs> we, we did found the genuine coin, it has a historical relevance, we put it in the vehicle, and again, it's a one-off vehicle that, that our friends down there really appreciate us helping them And out. then Ben, let's bring up those seats too, because there's some detail in the seats I, I want to get you to talk about that are just extra, look at that. Yeah, so that was, that was quite a nice breakthrough with, with the laser etching. Uh, and that is oh, is that what, it, that, I was gonna ask, yes. it's not sewn. No, it's, no, no. So this, 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 this pattern that you see there is laser edging. So you just carefully take off the top layer of the, of the, of the leather and reveal the secondary layer, on, layer underneath it. And it's the kind of pattern that you might see in expensive cowboy boots. Exactly, exactly. Now here the good news is this is not um, just for the Texas Rangers. That is something that you can get in the, in the RAM long, uh, in, long uh, top, in the long run yeah. edition. The top edition. So you can get that today? This you can get. Wow. Uh, the Texas Ranger badge is, is again a special but uh, this uh, cool pattern on the seat that is available to the customer. Yeah, and th this is what we really noticed. I mean, in, in, in what's changed so much in, in interior design, and, and particularly in trucks, and, and uh, you, you look at just how the wood trim is done and all the stitching and, and, and the attention to detail that you never used to see this kind of stuff never. in a truck. And, and in fact, you never even saw it in a, in a, a, a lot of uh, cars or, or trucks that normal people could afford. And, and now you see all this really, the, really, the attention to detail and the nice colors and the, um, uh, just the way everything lines up. I mean, it, it's just... Uh, you look at this, and now you see with Chrysler's, uh, their focus on what they call the Easter eggs, where you yeah. have the little treats for, for for people that you find. You know, right. it's it's just um, it, it's it's really fun to look at, and I, I think it's something that that Chrysler has really created um, in the industry is is making these these little design details that are that right. Are and lots I want to get fun. into. I'm glad you raised that, Drew, because you know when when you look at a Ram, you know whether it's uh, you know a Longhorn or here the special one-off Texas Ranger, 
you can spend a lot of money on that. So let's talk about the Jeep Renegade, and I know we got some pictures of that, because that's at the opposite end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, Ben, throw some pictures up there. Yeah, the Renegade is a special vehicle for, for many reasons. Number one, just like you say, it's on the opposite side of the financial scale, which makes our job so much more fascinating. Uh, I learned on my previous employer that it's so much easy to create a fantastic interior, have the coin. If you get the money, the funding, no problem. And that would where, be Mercedes, so for yeah, those yeah, of yeah. you, you who are, uh, yeah. I, okay, I said that. <laughs> and, um, but where we take a lot of pride is, is at, 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 in our design studio is coming up with really cool, smart solutions that do not break the bank. Sometimes, yes, you have to ex, uh, add money if you want to have better leather. But there's a lot of cool uh, solutions that just are good design and not financially expensive. And that's why we can do uh, this, this, what I think, really cool interior for the, for the Renegade. Well, you see th things like, well, first of all, the, 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 the chances and the risks that you take with colors, you don't see a lot of automakers doing. And, and it's, it's, we really have, they're really a treat to drive. When you look at the Renegade and, and you see some of the um, different color combinations that you've had, the copper uh, colored trim, uh, aluminum trim. I don't even know I've ever seen that in a vehicle before, but it really works well with uh, uh, the way they've matched it up with other stuff. And uh, um, uh, what was I going to say? The, the, the stitching and everything else that you find in a car that starts at about $22,000 or whatever is, is really impressive. And um, yeah, the, there's the, the, the color. Um, yeah, and you're just and using accents, yeah. and they really pop. Yeah, I mean, yeah, bright colors against dark ones, but they, man, that's I'm and, sure and, and part of what you're talking about, right? We do have quite a variety of color offerings. Obviously, nothing, uh, not all of them are as provocative as yeah. the one you saw here. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to see the, 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 the customer spread in the Renegade. There's the young people and the people who want to be perceived young but go a little bit more conservative with the color. So the fascination is, again, with the job is that you, that you get the spread from a straightforward black interior all the way to the interior that we just saw. This one, for example, that we just saw with the red accents is the Trailhawk. Here you can have more like a silver, something you're more familiar with. But, you know, it's hold hold that one, Ben. Hold that a sec, too. Because uh, you can see on a bit of the, the seat cushion. The topographical map. Topographical yeah. map. Yeah, yeah. And there's another picture in there somewhere, too, where it's the etched into part bit. of the console. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I bring the uh, bring the discussion to that of yeah. how you introduce elements like this topographical map in yeah. the seat that re reflect the character of yeah. the car see the, the way we approach these things and and this is what you refer to as yeah. easter egg hidden treasures the way we approach these things is if you look into the market in any segment the the difference between all the manufacturers out there came down in terms of fuel consumption safety quality there's not really much differentiation left so how do you how do you differentiate in, uh, with with the car business? For us, it's important that that our customer knows the car is built or created by humans for humans. It's not done by a computer. It's not done by a robot. It's not done by a machine. For us, it's important that we put these little cool details in there that shows wow, this was done by 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 some by a person that had fun doing this, that, that is passionate about the job, that knows this is a Jeep and puts that Jeep flair in it. And and with little details like we just saw with a cubby bin, we're turning a cheap piece of plastic into a collector's item. And we do that, you know, not only in the Renegade and multiple programs, and it gives it this passionate human touch, the soul that we're looking for. So, so as, as I recall, the interior of the Renegade was done by a comparatively young designer. Yes, that is true. As a matter of fact, um, at that point, Ian Hatch is his name. Uh, at that point, he was the youngest uh, designer I have in my team. I said, why don't you have a stab at it? And we have a very, very small design team. I'm not at the luxury to say, hey, 20 designers, you go into competition. You know, we almost have to handpick who we think can do it. And we also, because we're so small, we also uh, had to rely on getting everyone up to speed very quickly. Everyone is capable of doing a production design. So I could go to him and say, you know what? I think this is you. Why don't you try it? And he came up with this really cool work of art. Um, especially when you look at some of the sketches he did on the way to get to this, there's some really intriguing stuff. <laughs> oh, so you know, is it, is it his youth that, that, that manifests itself in, in many of the details that Drew was talking about in terms of the, the colors and the textures and the material um, surfaces and so on? There's a little bit of everything. See, um, yes, I do, I do, you know, light the fuse a little bit when it comes to certain things. Um, but it's really, see, the team is, this is not 2005 anymore where 
whether it was Ralph, myself, or whoever else in the leadership, had to like, come on, guys, push the, push the team. Now they are pulling us. We're like, whoa, hang on, guys. You know, it's like, uh, this might be a little bit too crazy. But the team has really come around. You've seen that transition from a, from a losing team to a potentially winning team where, where the guys have earned the self-confidence and the respect that, that again, feeds that self-confidence. So you see a lot of these ideas. And, and I can't wait to, to, for the next round of programs to come out because it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get even better, even, even I, I can't say crazy because that's the wrong word, but more and more f fascinating with, with yet what, they, what they're creating. They're, it's, I'm just blown away. I'm amazed. Every day I come to work about the creativity I find in the studio. Absolutely. Yeah, can you show a picture of the instrument cluster, a, a, a close-up of that? I just want, it, it, it's a can you go back to that, Ben, on the, uh, on the Renegade, the instrument cluster? Yeah, so what you're pointing out is that is that splash, right? Yeah. So I don't so know if you, you can if you, see it there, yeah. yeah. The tachometer. It's, it's on the tech is the splash, uh, it's a little red, red splash there that you is. can see it better. Oh, yeah. And that is, that is now in the, in the PR material, in the public relation materials, it says politically correct, it's a mud splash, but reality is this is a paintball splash. And, and what we did is, because we do like hang out as a team, we, we party together, we work and, and, and play together. And we went and played paintball, and, and sure enough, I was, I was hit on, you know, on a mask, <laughs> And the designer thought, that's kind of cool. I think so, like shooting your boss. I, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, I can't be, you know. So, so uh, the next day he puts the paintball splash on there. And I could have sworn it would not make the committees and the reviews and the this and that. And because this is something you can quickly change last second. It's just a print, right? It would not make production. I could have sworn my salary on it. And here we have it, which also speaks for now for two things. The company at large is having fun and is letting us get away with a lot of things, but also shows how much responsibility we care. We cannot just do crazy things and call on the company to catch it and protect us. We have a high responsibility of making sure we don't do too crazy things. But this was on the right side of the line. So let's go to the opposite of crazy. And Ben, let's bring up some of those pictures of the interior of the 300. Because instead of being wild and crazy yeah. and out there, very elegant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not subdued, yeah. you know, but very tasteful, very elegant. So it's, and let's start talking about the steering wheel. You've done this white yeah. insert that's an option, I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And God, does that make the interior pop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I agree. This is the end of the side of the spectrum. And, and that is one of the fascinating side of our job because, you know, if we, we control so many brands, um, that means there's, there's a room for every idea. It's not that we only have Jeep to worry about and, and someone might come up with this idea for a steering wheel and you say, no, it can't be in a Jeep. But there's an idea, but sometimes you have to put the idea on a shelf and then you can use it in a vehicle like the Chrysler 300. And it was, for us, it was important to bring back this, this the great American sedan. And, and quite honestly, that's, the 300 is the car that, that I came to the U.S. From the European perspective, that was the car. It was just so amazingly cool. That, uh, that made me come here. And, and now to be able to work on it and elevate it with these color combinations, uh, there, was, there was something really, really fun. So well, well, you mentioned earlier this is no longer 2005. Mm -hmm. What changed? Well, in 2005 um, and then 2005, 2006, uh, number one, we had to go from, you, you called it worst to best. I don't know if we were the rest or were the worst, and I don't know if we were the best, but from the extremes, we had to convince the company to trust us. Um, and that's twofold. Um, first, yes, we have to ask for some money. Uh, and on the first program, they're like, really, can you do it better than, the, than your predecessors? You also asked for money, but didn't, I don't know if, we're, if, if we got the return. But you have to create a, a, a trust basis and a respect basis in the company, which we now enjoy. I think we, we can fairly say there, there's a level of trust and respect uh, towards design, but also from us towards an engineering and manufacturing. There's, there's a friendship. The, 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 the bankruptcy was a catalyst, um, certainly, because um, suddenly only those people hang back who believe in the company and hang, were hanging back who were believing in what we were cooking at that time. The 300, the Charger, the Durango, the Grand Cherokee, those programs were all underway while we were going through bankruptcy. So only those people who believe in the company stayed back. And it was a very small company. And at that time, there was this, we created the family that we're now still enjoying. And now one of my biggest tasks is when I hire someone that I make sure they fit this, this culture and we don't get a subculture. That's a great point, that you don't get a subculture. That could be hard I can, to avoid. I, I only hire 
individual, maximum two people at a time. I, I will not hire more than two people, individuals at the time, because the risk is, oh, we're the new guys, so let's hang out together, and the guy's going to get together to the sundry shop, they're going to hang out in the evenings. We want to make sure that we use uh, individuals, we, we hire them individually, one or two at a time, to make sure they have no other choice but be infiltrated by, the, by what I believe is a great culture that we have. And the culture is probably the most important asset that we have. That, the, the work creates itself. You were asking me about, do I have to inspire people? The Easter egg, it comes out of this wonderful uh, culture that, that we were able to create under, under Ralph Jill's leadership. Mm -hmm. So. You know, you mentioned the 300, and um, presumably when you saw the 300, you saw the exterior of mm. that car and said, wow, that, that is really something. What was the catalyst for interior design to elevate as high as it did, yeah. certainly within your organization? It's, it's, it's difficult to say. You know, uh, um, if, 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 I, if I take the, the RAM as an example, which was that first program that, that I was assigned to back in 2005, 2006, there were, there were a couple of things that, that now in hindsight you think like, wh why would we have done it like that? Um, it, it could be the color choice, it could be the shapes. You know, let, let's, let's take one example and then I want to get away from that time because I, don't, I, I just want to forget that time to be honest. I think the company wants to move on too. Well, actually we're coming up to a break. There you so go. Why, why, why don't we take a quick <laughs> break forget the question. and we can come back to this thought. Because we got to pay some bills here, and we've got to give a, a shout out to our, our great friends at Bridgestone. So I said you could come back to that thought, Klaus, but maybe we better not go there. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it doesn't help anyone these days anymore to say, okay, this is what we did 10 years ago. This 10 years ago is the past. Um, you know, we, we're happily, I think we're ready to look in the future. I think we have a team that we can be very proud of, an organization, uh, support from management. The stars are aligning currently, so that's good. Does that help attract the talent that you want? Do you have trouble attracting no, young um, talent? No, no, not at all, actually. Um, I think um, it's, it's, we went from a, from a well, now I'm going to go back 10 years ago. <laughs> We went from a phase where uh, you, you had to think twice whether you want to put that company needle into your jacket on an outer show and, and you were proud of, of, of uh, who you represented to like, wow, you guys at Jeep, you kicking ass or Chrysler or whatever badge you were wearing that day or SRT, Ram, all of them. And, 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 and people really, the, the, the word in the design community has spread about number one, the work we do and number two, the culture that we have. It's a very small community. And the best testimony to this, the, the, turnaround, uh, the, the turnover rate, uh, I can't really think about having lost anyone throughout those five years, maybe one or two people, or 10 years, I should say, one or two people for family reasons, uh, that, that someone moved and they, whatever. But we have almost zero turnover rate. Hmm. That's pretty unusual. It's, it is, and, and we're very proud of that, you know. And, and do you, when you look at, your competitors, whether they're domestic or, or international competitors, what are the things that you look for and, and you say to yourself, you know, we, we've got to get that? Yeah, you know what? Um, it's a fascinating question because uh, certainly I could have given you a whole laundry list five, six years ago. Um, and now uh, I just got back from the Shanghai Auto Show um, or whether it's Geneva or any of the auto shows. And there's still things where, where, um, where I think, yeah, you know, that's a cool idea, that's a cool idea. But overall, I think in our segment, which is important to understand, you know, you can always go and look at the, the Germans or some other brands and say, wow, they, they got this and they got that. But in the segments we're playing, I think we're doing really good. Now the dangerous part is not to be arrogant and, and rest on our, our laurels. And I think the Chrysler 300 that we just talked about is, is a good example because the Chrysler 300, the previous model, was already award-winning according to what... Yeah. And, and yet, we did not rest on our laurels. We said, you know what? We got this cool new technology, the rotary e-shifter, the next generation Uconnect, plus the seven inch cluster, plus all these cool ideas with materials and colors. Let's, let's upgrade the car, even though it's already award winning. And I think that, that, is, that is what, the motivation comes out of ourselves now. It's not so much the competition anymore. It's, it's trying to constantly up the game. See, the, the, the winning the awards is a fascinating thing. I can't tell you, we're not designing cars to win awards. We're always designing cars for the customer. The award winning seems to be a nice side effect, but at the same time, they put pressure on you because you think like, man, you know, if I go back, this is the fifth year now, or in five years, we've won nine awards. And that is, that is quite a burden. 
because now it's like, what happened if we don't win an award, right? So suddenly you think about that. But again, the motivation comes out of the internal um, drive for success and, and, and to do the best for our customer. And believe me, there's a whole list of things, regardless of competition, that we want to get better at. So it's my view that automakers do some of their best work when their backs are to the wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've seen that a lot with, with certainly with Detroit automakers where they're just on the brink and wow, then everybody is really, really scared and suddenly and management now is willing to try anything because they're just, they're, they're uh, staring at the abyss and then suddenly, wow, we see some fantastic cars come out. I mean, with Chrysler uh, going back a couple generations with cab over, uh, cab forward design or, or whatever, a lot of innovation comes through that. And it seems like, well, like so many organizations, then when things are going good, people get more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's when innovation slides off. Do you worry about that as Chrysler's yeah, going through yeah. a pretty, pretty good period it's now? It's a very, very fair question. And, and, I, and I can relate to that question, but I can, I can tell you with with all my conviction here, you will not see that happen in our place. Absolutely zero happen. If that's going to happen, that's the first day I'm going to say, okay, that's it, I'm going to go. Same with Ralph, same with, with the whole management team. I think, I think we, we are children of that, of that uh, ex, you know, the bankruptcy has left such a lasting expression, uh, impression on me and, 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 and Ralph and the whole team. You will not see that happen, absolutely not. So when you have people that you're bringing in to work mm -hmm. on interior designs, mm -hmm. are these people who are necessarily auto people or are you looking at people who are interested in in fashion or materials or or consumer electronics yeah. uh, see uh, my, my group consists of all of the above actually and that makes um, my job and my team's job so fascinating yes we have um, the standard uh, CCS graduate here from downtown Detroit um, the, the automotive designer into exterior we have fashion people and now with user experience playing a more and more important role, you got to look to a totally different set of schools and, 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 and people um, to, to hire. So the, the diversity in the group is immense, um, not only from the skill set, but their backgrounds. They are, they're, they're, you know, if you look at the interior group, the diversity is, is, is almost mind blowing, which again makes it so strong because you really have people from all groups of, of uh, the society, which is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got some uh, questions and comments that coming in from our, our viewers. Smooth says, now that you got more ability, please look into swivel bucket seats. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good point. See, um, the whole industry is looking at swivel seats because uh, we're all thinking about that self-driving car and what you're going to do when the car is actually driving uh, itself. Are you going to want to do you want to turn around the, the, the seat? Uh, we have some experience with that because we had on a previous generation minivan, we did have second row swivel seats. Swivel and go. Swivel and go, correct. Now, the, the reality of the matter is um, to turn a seat around while you're driving requires tons of space right. because the, the, the backrest is, uh, is reclined. You have your legs plus the whole body so that the footprint of the seat would be too much right. to, be, to be achievable in, in a standard footprint car. Um, so it comes with a lot of... Um, you know, but there were some swivels in the in the past, going even back to the 1960s, that would only turn halfway, so you yeah. could get in and out of a car. Yes, easily. that's correct. And and I know um, there's there's you know there's you know we, we deal with a lot of suppliers. There's you know half swivel or quarter swivel, but everyone came to the conclusion right now, unless you have a bus, uh, the swivel seat really is is something tough to master, yeah. just because of the real estate you need. And and today too, with safety standards, it's yeah. a whole lot tougher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to have so much structure in this. Yeah, seat. but that that's something we already mastered with 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 a minivan. It had integrated seat belts. The structure was sturdy enough. No, it really comes down to the footprint that you require to actually swivel that thing around. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, Johnson Controls actually uh, for a seating supplier for uh, actually Soon to be X seating supplier yeah, showed uh, showed off a uh, a concept at the the last uh, North American Auto yeah. Show that uh, where they they swivel like 16 degrees yeah, that's something the one like I was that yeah okay There's a little yeah. bit of that so you have that conversation but it doesn't fully swivel for the yeah. same reason because you couldn't have the real estate James Crabtree uh, tweeted in to know what are your thoughts about uh, the i3 BMW and mm. I, he's asking I think because last week we yeah. we had uh, Sandy Monroe who did a big teardown of yeah. the i3 no both i3 and i8 um, have my utmost respect um, for for many many reasons um, 
this, a car like that cannot be done as an afterthought, like, hey, let's do something like this for the next auto show. That is, that is a testimony of, of a long-range plan. They must have started that thought process at least 10 years ago. And, and, and BMW has my highest respect for that. In terms of uh, the exterior design, I personally like it. I just saw a couple of them on the road in Los Angeles. The interior is interesting. I'm going to leave it there um, because they do experiment uh, with some colors that, uh, sorry, not colors, materials yeah. mostly, mm -hmm. that you will have to think once or twice about, you know, does it fit the character of the car? Is it, is it, is it pleasant? Is it, is it attractive? You know, but the car as a concept has my highest respect. Yeah, Klaus is being uh, nice, but, but the i3 actually made it on our 10 best interiors list as well, and, and um, we really liked it. It, it is, but the materials, a lot of them have recycled content yeah. in them, and there are surfaces and things like that that some people won't like, but yeah. it's, it, it's, yeah, just the, the concept is fabulous. Are there, are there materials that, that are not generally used in the auto industry that you think should be used? Other materials. Uh, I know Mercedes. Back in the day, we played with stone, yeah. and, and we, yeah. Went, we, we, we. Yeah, I thought yeah. it looked cool. Yeah, we went away. Um, I don't think there is because if there is, uh, believe me, we're working on getting it in there, and I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you what that is. Then, mm -hmm. so um, no, I think the stuff that's missing we will have. The stuff that's not missing will not do so. But I mean, it always surprises me the extent to which now leather has become mm. such a such a big material. Leather is an interesting topic. You know, um, I'm, I'm going to use maybe 30 seconds of your time to talk sure. about that quickly here. Because leather is actually not that superior material that, that there's better materials out there. Um, we talked behind the, behind the wall, we talked about a bit of Louis Vuitton earlier, right? And we know Louis Vuitton is not leather, and yet it's, it, is, it is a good material. There are so many synthetic materials that are out there that are superior to leather. You know, no one wants it to wrinkle, uh, no one wants it to, to lose color. There's so many deficiencies uh, in, in leather, yet we love it for what it stands. You know, the, the smell, and even the smell is, 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 is artificial, as we know. It's not the real uh, smell. What, and then, then you have materials like, for example, Alcantara, which are not leather-based. They're, they're artificial, but they have this cool name. Polymer. <laughs> it's a polymer-based, which really yeah. is, is very surprising I to think, me that everybody think thinks it's if, suede. If we have in your viewership people who work in that industry, my biggest pledge to you would be work on your marketing campaign and come up with cool names because yeah. it just doesn't sound good if I say this is polyurethane or vinyl. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they got to come up with something that is like Alcantara because, wow, Alcantara sounds good, but it's not better or worse than vinyl or polyurethane. It just has a cool name to it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Marketing is key. Wow. Marketing yeah, is key. Yeah, even with materials. Absolutely. Klaus, we're at the end of the segment. I want to thank you for coming on. It's been awesome. Very interesting discussion on interior design. I know we can go on for another 10 hours. But we'll uh, e easily. Thank you. easily. Well, well, we'll have you back again. <laughs> we'll have you back again. But it's been awesome having you. Thank you. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and talk about some of the news that's been happening this week. You already know that you can listen to AutoLine's Industry Insight in places like YouTube and Stitcher, but did you know that you can also listen to it live in your car? It's simple. Just pair your smartphone with your vehicle's Bluetooth connection or plug into the aux jack. Then navigate to AutoLine.tv using your phone's browser. Find the show you want to hear and click play just like you would on your computer. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy. It's that easy. Never be disconnected from AutoLine's top-notch insider information with AutoLine on the go. So a lot going on in the industry right now. Yeah, seems like, huh? So uh, let's start with Piek at Volkswagen, because I'm just fascinated by what went on there and I'm dying to hear what you guys have to think about that or say about it, Gary. But you see, you see, the, see the newest one that um, his nieces are being promoted to the board? And, yeah. And, and he doesn't want to see replace this him and his wife. And yeah. uh, they're like, they're, yeah. they, they don't want any part of that. I mean, it's, it's a particularly different situation because there's family involved in a way that yeah. family is not involved, you know, even even with the Ford family. I mean, it's it's, uh, um, you know, a giant company that that has, you know, DNA in the in in the in the in the mix. And uh, I mean, it, it's it's incredibly interesting to look at, I mean, how well Volkswagen Group has been doing, um, you know, he tries to make a play to get rid of uh, an executive and finds himself 
not working there anymore. Yeah, well, I, it was it was funny to see how everyone was handicapping who was going to come out ahead. It was like everyone was watching a, an episode of Dynasty or, something or <laughs> that's, whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know? that's, that's exactly and, and, right. And, and, and you know, so, well, is he going to come up on top? Why am I betting on him? He's you know, and uh, 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 my feeling is everyone says, well, you know, he lost. He took a big risk, you know, and now he, you know, he was brought down. The guy still owns a boatload of shares. He's got a lot of, I think he's still going to be pulling strings behind the scene. We haven't heard the last of him. And I think, I, I, and he is such a, well, a known manipulator right. that I think this could be some sort of faint play on his, you know, everybody thinks, oh, he's giving up and going away. I don't think that's going to happen. He's mm -hmm. going to, there's, there's going to be. But he is off the board, right? He's stepping right. down from the board. That's going to uh, pull a lot of direct power. I mean, he can't vote now. Right. He can pull strings behind the scene, but I got to wonder what will those string pullings be or what will the company do now that he's gone? And so just to throw out something to get, you know, stir the pot here, you know, we all know that the Phaeton was his baby. He wanted to see Volkswagen brand have this big grand sedan. It's been a you know, a disaster. Well, it's a financial it's still being sale. sold, though, right? It's in, still being it, sold in, in China. Europe, or in, in Europe. In, in Europe, China. right. Okay. But the numbers are inky dinky. Yeah, well, it's, it's, yeah right. that's a vanity play. It probably would right. never be still on the market if it so, probably weren't So we'll him. finally, the board, go, hey, let's get rid of this turkey. It's, We're yeah. not there, making any There's money. a picture of one in China because you could see the uh, bird's nest uh, stadium that was behind it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, you know, but you, you think about it, I mean, the the money that Volkswagen it, Volkswagen Group is making, they're making money on Audi, they're making money on um, Bentley um, and Porsche and Porsche especially, yeah, and uh, so commercial trucks too, by the way. Right. So so you think about it. I mean, a Fiat and who's even going to notice, right? I mean, you you make it, you put it. Yeah, out but there, you know. But, Let's it's, say it's not, you've it, lost a billion dollars on that program. It's probably even more than that, by the way. Couldn't Volkswagen of America really use a billion dollars right yeah. now in marketing and in incentives in product? And so so I, I hear what you're saying is like, yeah, that's kind of a drop in the bucket when you look at the. But man, VWOA could use that money last year. Two right, years but, ago. But I mean, three is, years is ago. the underpinnings of the of the Phaeton used as an Audi? Is it an A8, maybe uh, A6? Yeah, I, I believe it is part of the A8. So, you know, the, the vaunted MQB, I mean, no problem. I mean, it's yeah, just yeah. A, you're, you're, that, that in, those engineering costs are being absorbed, no problem. But, but they built that whole special factory, the in glass Dresden. factory for it in yeah. Dresden. And, and uh, um, there, there was, well, they spent a lot of money on mm -hmm. it. I don't think that would have been okayed by any board that wasn't, you know, totally controlled by somebody. Mm -hmm. but, but, and then particularly you look at the dealership angle where you're, you were asking people paying, you know, Mercedes S-Class money for to go to a Volkswagen dealership, right? You know, they just aren't the dealers just not could happen. not could not deliver the the buying experience or anything else. Hmm. You know, the other one I wonder about is Seat. Their Spanish brand has been a perennial money loser. Although I did see they turned a profit in the first quarter of this year, mm -hmm. but that. Before I saw that, when the, the results came out yesterday, that's what I was also wondering. Would a new board say, you know, let's just kill it. We're not making money on this, and, you know, let's just cut our losses and put all that money into bolstering up the other but, brands. Okay, but, but don't executives like to have many, many brands because this just seems to indicate to them that they're more powerful? But you know, they, they have Seat, and they have Skoda. Mm -hmm. They have two entry-level brands, and now they're starting some other third entry-level brand in China. I mean, how many entry-level brands? Well, so you have you have one in Western Europe, you have one in Eastern Europe. I mean, come on, it's uh... but it's making money, so I mean, it's maybe a lower priority. I, I think the biggest mystery about Volkswagen to me, and it's it's been there for forever, is how can it be so successful in every market of the world except pretty much the U.S. Somehow it just doesn't do well. And the U.S. or, or uh, you know, I guess the, the short answer is trucks. They don't, you know, they're See, not. But I wonder if it's trucks truck so much, or is, is that okay? If if you know, we've all been to Germany, and you talk to Germans, and Germans are going to buy German cars, right? I mean, they're yeah. going to buy German cars just regardless. They don't care what else is out there. And and I think that over the years, in a place like the United States, we become more comfortable with with buying European cars, with buying Asian cars, with buying American cars. You know, we're we're more inclusive in terms of what we're going to buy. So as a result of that, you've got really serious competition among 
you know, the, you know, General Motors wants to best Toyota and Toyota wants to best General Motors and Ford wants to beat so on. You know, and so, so you have really strong competition that Volkswagen doesn't face anywhere else in the world, basically, right? Because nobody's going to say, well, am I going to buy a Golf or am I going to buy a Corolla? I mean, it's not even a consideration yeah. if you're in yeah, Germany. Yeah, but you know what? The, the weird thing is, if you go back three years ago when the then new Passat was out, uh, and uh, and they were building that in Chattanooga, and and that development program was beat Toyota Camry. That is what that was. What was behind them and, in, in and that the car? The first year and a half. They were off to the races. This right. is when they had come out and said, we're going to be the biggest in the world and all that and stuff. And man, their sales just took off. And then like in 2013, boom, they kissed bricks. It came to a halting, screeching halt. And it was like, wait a minute. It, it's still a nice car. What the hell happened? Yeah, but if you, look, if, you look, if you look at the numbers for, which I don't have here, which I know is going to disappoint people <laughs> profoundly <laughs> out there. <laughs> But, I mean, if you look at the sales numbers for all of Volkswagens in the United States, I mean, until the Golf began to put some life into it, man, they were selling virtually nothing. I mean, I remember last year when, uh, you know, the, the bright shining uh, star was the uh, uh, Beetle Cabrio. I mean, <laughs> it's like... Right, you know, not well, good. It's, forever I've heard dealers c complain about this this whole idea of cadence, where in, in the in the U.S. the products come in, you know, they come in three at a time or too many at a time, and then there, there's this huge lull where there's nothing there, and you can't you can't what, build a. That's what they call fire and forget. Yeah. You launch the product, you have a big advertising campaign, then you're on to the next one. Yeah. So we'll come back. We got a lot more to talk about of what's going on in the industry. We're going to take a quick break. A little chemistry goes a long way, especially when it comes to vehicle development. From enabling the use of alternate materials to withstanding extreme vehicle environments, Henkel's adhesive, sealants, and surface technologies provide solutions for every vehicle segment. Come see for yourself. Our Detroit area headquarters offers 12 research and development and testing laboratories with the ability to do full range testing and validation on actual vehicle parts. Sign up to tour our labs at henkelna.com forward slash tour. And, of course, we want to thank Hankel for making this show possible, along with Bridgestone and anybody else who wants to join the party. <laughs> Let's change topics here, because uh, another big thing that's been going on this week is Sergio Marchion running around telling everybody, we got to have a partner. Everybody's got to consolidate. Drew, what do you read into what he, why he's doing this so, so vehemently? Well, he's looking for a partner. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting a lot of pressure, I think, and, and uh, you know, it's it's so hard to compete globally now, and, and they're making, Chrysler, I think, is making most of the money it's making in the U.S. now, and suddenly you see the same thing, just like when they were partnered up with, with Daimler, um, Chrysler was a star when they were making lots of money, but when suddenly, if we see, you know, couple of years the market starts going down globally or whatever and Chrysler starts being this cash cow he's kind of with the rest of the assets they have scattered throughout the world aren't very strong and uh, he needs to he needs to have a stronger company get stronger revenue and everything else to um, to keep the machine running and it's going to be tough the way he is now well you know he was talking on an earnings call this week about um and, and this, this surprised me quite a bit. He was talking about having companies develop engines together in a big way. And he says, ah, people don't care about that. Now, you might look at the fact that, that um, the Renault-Nissan Alliance and Daimler have gotten together on engines, you know, but they're very limited. But, I mean, I got the sense from, from what Marchione seemed to be saying is just like, you know what? If they can't see it, smell it, or touch it, screw it. You know, we're going we're gonna to have that be done by someone else, and that will be a partner with us. And uh, that might be an exaggeration of the situation. But uh, um, he was talking about the amount of money that is being burned in product development by every company on an ongoing basis. And he's saying this is just not sustainable. Therefore, you have to have companies get together in, in this development and save some of that money. 
Well, and he's looking at, you know, carbon standards that, that are looking tougher and tougher going out, you know, only maybe one product cycle now if we get to about 2018, especially 2022, both in, in the U.S. and, and globally. The, the development for powertrains are getting really, really expensive. Mm -hmm. And we are, but the thing is, we are seeing, you know, automakers uh, combining resources on the really risky stuff like fuel cells. And then they started, they, they did, they've, they've done lots of powertrain collaborations yeah. before on the sure. risky GM stuff. GM and Chrysler have done transmissions, designing a new one as we speak that they're sharing on. And remember, in the not too distant past, Saturn actually sold vehicles with Honda engines in them. And so, yeah. But that was, un, that was unbadged and uh, the, those red lines were not told, you know, that was not um, Well, GM of, ma never made a big deal that right. they had Honda engine. Yeah. But I got to believe at the dealership, the salesperson would have said, you know, that's got a Honda engine yeah. in it. Right. So I, but, but, would it, but would it have been as good if it were the sales guy saying, this is an engine that is developed by General Motors and Honda? And, yeah. it, 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 you know, of, of, you know, General Motors of that age, mm -hmm. you know, which was not so, so I, well regarded. I see another thing going on, too, is uh, Chrysler's cash pile is starting to go down. I think it just dropped by another billion, two or three in the last quarter. And I think uh, and their debt level is uh, pretty high for a company their size. And I, my guess is Sergio's going, to your point, Drew, man, we're making a lot of money on Jeeps and Rams and Durangos and all that right now. But we know there's a downturn in the American market. And when this cash cow goes away, man, I got nothing. And I got to pour billions into trying to build Alfa Romeo up into something. At the same time, I got to spend even more billions keeping my other lines going. And I know that any big deal is probably going to take a year or two to put together. And if I look out a couple of years, man, my cash pile's even smaller. So I got to start shaking, you know, the trees right now. Who can I partner with? Who, who will come and partner with me? Because I've got to negotiate from a position in, of strength. And in a couple of years, I'm not going to be as strong as I am right now. And so you heard Carlos Tavares, the head of PSA, Peugeot, saying, oh, we're not interested in doing a deal right now. And I think that's Tavares' way of sort of admitting, if I try to negotiate with anybody right now, I'm in a real right. weak position. Mm, PSA right. is starting to improve, but it's still extremely weak. But Tavares knows in a couple of years, he's going to be in a much better position to negotiate. And I think that's part of the dynamic that's going on right now. Sergio needs a deal as fast as he can have because he's in a strong position today. Tavares doesn't want to do a deal right now because he'll be in a stronger position tomorrow. Yeah, but honestly, okay, if, if, if FCA gets together with PSA, I mean, come on. The, a, a French company that, that has minuscule sales, you know, even in, you know, they sell more cars in China than they sell in France, okay? And it's, it's partially owned by the French government. I mean, so is, is that going to save Marchioni's bacon? No. I, I don't think so at no, all. No, no, I mean, no. That's just one, one leg of the stool. He needs an Asian partner, big time. He needs somebody in China right now. Well, but PSA can take care of that. I mean, they're, they're building plants they're there. Building and they're plants doing there, the, right. the DS line there. But, it's doing but very even well. better, you know, I, I still think going after somebody like Great Wall or uh, Geely or so, even BYD. But wouldn't they go after him? I mean... It, Why not? It, I mean, I, I think it, he'd do it. Be, I mean, isn't this going to be that 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 FCA would be absorbed by somebody rather than than it doing the absorbing? Yes, absolutely. Who's but, ever got the most cash is going to win. And let's the you know, I think some of this is simply job security for Sergio because you know we all know he's this you know this incredible workaholic. I think it's he, a retirement he, plan. He talks about retiring, but but he really doesn't want to retire. He wants to do some big huge deal that's going to take a few years. Oh, he and, does the deal, and then he's like. Huh. And now I'll retire. Well, you know, yeah. he's got to think about his legacy. Yeah. No question about it. And look, the guy is made bucket loads of money. You know, he can he can walk away from this this afternoon and say, you know, I'm sick and tired of it. But he doesn't want to get pushed out. You know, I mean, and, and, and uh, yeah, I, I just think part of this is he still wants to be he still wants to be on top for a while. And mm -hmm. if he does some big, huge deal, that'll keep him busy for yeah. for good many years. Well, we got to we got to talk about some product. I mean, Cadillac announcing the CTSV this uh, yesterday. In fact, I think that that's pretty significant. What these guys are really uh, really throwing down that they're going to uh, 
to you know win the horsepower war against the uh, likes of Mercedes and uh, and BMW. I think that's that's pretty pretty risky play that uh, that uh, Denation is doing there with uh, you know coming out with a 6.2 liter supercharged V8 that uh, is going to be producing 640 horsepower. I mean. Uh, that's that's some big stuff that serious they're doing power. there. Serious, serious power, and uh, so uh, you know they've got the they've got the ATSV, and uh, so I started looking at to see the power to, to weight ratio, which is which is a good way of of, oh, yeah. of looking at yeah. cars, and so um, so the the regular ATS coupe with a three point six liter V eight that has three hundred twenty horsepower weighs thirty four hundred eighteen pounds. So it has a power weight ratio of 0 0.093. So okay. state at the other, how many pounds per horsepower? Do you know? I didn't figure that one out. Because that's the only way I yeah. know how it works. Right. <laughs> but okay, but just look at it this way. So, so a, 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 higher, a higher number is better. So if you look at the ATS-V, it weighs 3,700 pounds, right? It weighs more than the ATS Coupe. And I thought, wow, that's strange. So I contacted Cadillac and said, why does it weigh more? And they said, "Well, we had to we had to beef the car up, yeah, because of you know the, the yeah, demands, yeah, some big bracing, yeah, yeah, that that are being put on it, and that accounts. Mm -hmm. So we took as much weight out of it as we could, but we had to add weight. Mm. So anyway, so it's got six hundred, it's four hundred and sixty four horsepower, okay. So it's got a point one two five, okay, not the normal one, point zero nine three. Yeah, this one one point one two five. Okay, so now we've we've gone way up. So then you look at the the regular CTS with a 3.6 liter engine. Okay, it weighs 3,952 pounds and produces 420 horsepower. So that's 0 0.10. Okay, so that's a little bit less than the ATS V, but it's a hell of a lot more than an ATS. Now you look at the CTS V. Okay, 400 4,145 horsepower. No pounds. Yeah. Can you imagine if you have a car with 4,100? I, yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, its number is 1.5. I mean, it's, it's awesome. I mean, and so is, is this the right thing for Cadillac to be doing, to be throwing out? Well, John, John was talking earlier about, uh, well, what we were talking before the show about the immense profitability of Mercedes and, and why luxury cars are so important. If you take, I'm sure, the luxury divisions of AM, or the performance units, uh, you know, AMG and uh, in, 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 in Mercedes and, and the others, performance units, their profit margins, I'm sure, is even higher. They are. And that's where it's a key, I, I think, performance is really key, even in this era where we're looking at, at you know, so, such tough fuel economy. This niche market of high performance luxury, I think, is enormously profitable. It's a great way to build your brand. And I think, and well, I'm sure that's why, uh, you know, Cadillac is doing this. Mm -hmm. and, and it's maybe even a faster way rather than trying to out luxury Mercedes or whatever. You can certainly, GM and Cadillac certainly has the engineering to make a, a car that can perform uh, along the lines but of that's a, a good point because you know you can argue luxury all day long. Yeah. Luxury in many cases is in the eye of the beholder, or it may not be easily quantified. You yeah. get the performance, the stopwatch don't lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My car is faster, or it brakes better. It, you know, it's got horsepower. You know, you start mm -hmm. quoting horsepower, right. or torque numbers, or whatever. Engineers love it because it's all highly quantifiable. Right, right. But it's also something you can brag about and you can prove out on a track. Mm -hmm. and, and really, the, the ATS. Is just in regular form is one of my favorite cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, it handles terrific. Nonetheless, and, and I think Gary raises a really good point. Is this the proper route to go? I, I would say yes, because yeah. in addition to profits, it engenders a lot of brand loyalty. The, the, you know, the AMG, the M, the S, the V, the F at Lexus, mm -hmm. that generates a lot of brand loyalty. But I say you still raise the right point because, you know, I'm, I'm still amazed at you know, when uh, Olivier Francois did that Super Bowl ad with Eminem, introducing, yet again, the Chrysler 200, adopting the slogan imported from Detroit, and sales took off. And when you look at the Ron Burgundy ads for the Dodge Durango, which I thought were silly and infantile and 
the day those ads ran, sales of the Durango took off. And if you look at the Buick ads right now, you know, the old lady going, that's not a Buick. Damn if that hasn't translated into sales. That's what Cadillac needs. They need a brilliant marketing campaign where, uh, where sales take off the day those ads so start running. So you don't think Greatly is doing it? No. No. I don't see it in the sales numbers. I mean, their sales numbers are going nowhere. Mm -hmm. And the product is sensational. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. These are the best Cadillacs I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. In my career time, these are the finest yes. Cadillacs, best engineering, you know, lightweight, all this power to weight ratio and everything that you're quoting here. The product, they don't have a product problem. Mm -hmm. They have a brand image problem. Yeah. They have a sales problem. They have a market share problem. And advertising and marketing is what's going to change that around. And as the three different ads that I just cited show, it can happen this afternoon. Mm -hmm. You don't have to build this great brand equity and acquire heritage and get your people. No, it, you get the right ad, bang, it changes instantly. I disagree somewhat with luxury buyers because I think they're more discerning. And I think, you know, you look at, it took BMW 25 years to really Didn't take something. Lexus long. No, no. So and it, Lexus it, came out with these brilliant ads. Yeah. Remember the stacks of yeah, champagne yeah. glasses mm -hmm. and the ball bearings running down the gaps of the car? Bang, they hit the ground running. Yeah. But still, they came out with a product really that was a, a that was way better than a comparable. That you know, um, they were offering a fifty thousand dollar car for about thirty five grand at that point when they first rolled out. I mean, it was it was a massive but it's product still took effort. Those ads to have people go, ooh, look at that. Maybe I ought to run down to the store and see what this is all about. Yeah, no, I I, I think that works, but I think. In this in this market at this time, Cadillac has as a tougher it's a tougher mark to hit with with competing. You know, when your competitors are really strong, like BMW, Mercedes, Audi, and whatever, I think it's just man, it's just got to put in the the grunt work. It's going to take a lot of time to be considered equal, even though they've got a lot of the tools already there. You know, Klaus mentioned that he was at the Shanghai Auto Show last week, and, and last week Cadillac announced something else, that they were gonna have a plug-in hybrid version of the CT6, which, which sort of struck me as, as being appropriate and interesting. And so what I, what I thought was very interesting, so here you have this plug-in hybrid, and I thought, hmm, what's, what's, what are they putting in this plug-in hybrid? And so they're going to have an 18.4 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack, which consists of 192 cells. And I thought, hmm, what else consists, you know, what else has that? The new Volt sure. that'll be coming out has 18.4 kilowatt hours and 192 cells. That'd be crazy. Same battery pack. Okay, yeah. But the week before, Cadillac announced the new ELR. So I had figured we can have 18.4 kilowatt hours and 192 cells. Nope. It's got 17.1 kilowatt hours and 288 cells. Old tech. So what's going on with that? I mean, because remember the whole the whole knock on the ELR was that it was basically right. a Volt and Cadillac clothing? Right. And so you would have thought that they're using the same system? The, the, the new 18.192 cell that you quoted, it ain't ready. <laughs> that's my read of it. But I mean, but that's going to be the Volt and that'll be the yeah, but those are still deep into next year before they hit the market. So, so you just think it's just basically a matter of... Yeah, I, look, uh, we've got uh, an interview that we haven't run yet coming up with Chelsea Sexton. Battery price... Who's Chelsea Sexton? Oh, Chelsea Sexton is a an EV advocate and consultant to the industry. She really knows her stuff. She was also a consultant in uh, to the movie uh, Revenge of the Electric Car. So she's out in California and all that. She really knows her stuff, but uh, I just did an interview with her. Battery prices are coming down faster than anyone expected. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if you look at uh, the ELR, it has, uh, okay, so the Volt came out, the ELR came out. Now the ELR is getting the second gen of where the Volt was going and the new Volt coming out next year, or no, later this year, isn't it? Yeah, the new Volt yeah. later yeah. this year. That's going to be like the third gen, I think is what you might be able to call it. Maybe maybe the ELR has, you know, gen 1.5 and, and the new Volt will be 2.0. But but yeah, the, the ELR clearly doesn't have the latest tech. Well, and I, I, don't, I don't think they're going to be, uh, the ELR is selling in tiny amounts. You know what I mean? I don't think they're going to make some special... 
uh, well, it, it's, I can't see the ELR dictating any product programs or cadence at the, mm -hmm. the levels they're selling. I think they've... Well, the, Look, I'm impressed they're doing an upgrade yeah. to it. To your point, I mean, this thing's deadsville, right? Yeah. It, it, it just isn't selling. I mean, I was just so trying the to fact they're, they're going to upgrade yeah. it is actually, you know, uh, kudos to them. Yeah, because, I mean, if they're selling in, I was trying to think if it was in two digits or three digits. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, been, not been good. Right. But no plugins are selling in any volume. Uh, yeah. Actually, the, um, well, it depends on uh, the i3 is. Uh, well, I consider that an electric. Okay. Not a plug-in. Well, okay, well, because it's kind of both. You can get the range extender on Yeah, it, but so. everybody hates the range extender. Yeah, but, yeah, until <laughs> you need it. <laughs> but yeah, we heard uh, all about that last week. Well, the, yeah, uh, yeah, right. The range extender is not a good idea. Right. Well, hey, we're at the top of the hour here. We ought to wrap this up, but uh, cool having Klaus here. Yeah. yeah. Great guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, your point, you know, if it's a horsepower thing, that T-shirt he had on, the Hellcat, 707 horsepower, that even beats that new Cadillac. I know it. I know it. That's exact. Look, everybody is stunned at the horsepower they pulled out of that Hellcat yes. engine. Stunned. Yeah. And uh, as, you know, as you guys know, it does more than 707. Yeah. And they, they've yeah. got a couple of other upgrades they're ready for. Well, yeah, and they, they, the thing that it's real clear, they didn't just slap a supercharger on it, you know, and, oh, that's, oh, that's what we did. I mean, yeah. they did a lot of work on that engine. Mm -hmm. It's quite an engineering achievement. Yeah. But I do want that T-shirt. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Drew, thanks for coming on, man. Great having you here. It was good to be here. Good. And, Gary, let's do it again next week. All right, we'll do that. Okay. okay. So want all of you to join us again then. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by... Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Henkel, excellence is our passion. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.